Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another roguelike deep dive. It's been a hot minute, but we're ready to talk about the one, the only, RoboQuest. I know, kind of a cringe name. This is a roguelite as opposed to a roguelike. Main difference just being that there's a meta progression. There is a permanent stat increases that you can get in rogue lights that you don't really get in rogue likes. Anyway, this series is all about really just looking at each game that I dive into from the various aspects that make up a roguelike or a roguelite. The weapons, the enemies, the loot, the skills, the abilities, the classes, the environment, the soundtrack, the plot if there is one, all of these good things. And at the end of the day, hopefully you have a better idea of what the game is about and maybe a little bit of comparing and contrasting to other titles in the genre. Let's jump into RoboQuest. This game is an FPS roguelite. There is a lot to get into here. So let's start off with weapons. Every one of these games ends up being an action game where you fight things with weapons. I mean, not literally all of them. There's stuff like played up, which is like kind of a roguelike. Anyway, moving on, there are about 73 weapons and I checked this on both Wikipedia pages. Two Wikipedia pages run by two different groups of people having the same information. Wow, weaker weapons at the beginning, and then once you move into like Act 2 or 3, which I'll get into later, you start to find better weapons. Weapons fall into one of five main categories. Assault are things you would see in modern games. ARs, pistols, SMGs. Then we got precision, which is like precise weapons, snipers, rifles, and still uh, more unique stuff like bows and stuff like that. Then demolition, these are the explosive weapons. Even some throwables, grenades. Uh, there are also throwables and precision, like throwing knives. And then, finally, we have technology weapons, which is a little bit of everything. They can be ARs, they can be snipers, they can be explosives. But they're technologically advanced. They're kind of alien-ish weapons. These are not really rooted in reality. They're fun video game weapons. It's the best way to put it. Weapons then... Weapons then have an ammo type. It's either a magazine, so it's just like regular ammo with a count, or it's an energy bar and it, it kind of heat overheats over time and reloading just kind of vents the heat. And finally, weapons have their own set of stats. Base fire rate, base damage, your crit multiplier, general range, and then your affixes and potentially even alt fire modes. Affixes are affixes. This is a normal thing in games. These are the uh, additional stats that do additional things. There are base slash preset affixes in this game. Then there are some green and blue ones, you know, kind of basic and a little bit better. And then there are alt fire modes. Let's go into the regular affixes first. So again, green are pretty normal, pretty common. Blue are a little bit better versions of those common ones. This would be like, I don't know, chance to fire a buckshot shotgun round in addition to your regular AR ammo. Things like that, right? Just fun additional stuff. Fixes are randomly generated from a pool of modifier fixes, and they modify the performance of your projectiles. It's, uh, so many different ways you can go with this, and there are a lot of options to choose from here. Then with alt fires, these are forms of affixes that add a secondary fire. Things like just straight up shooting an extra missile or dropping down a small shield or even a rocket jump. Very fun, unique stuff, a lot more rare. And then we have the elements, like I said, there's only three elements in this game. There's lightning, ice, and fire. But of course, they're called different things. They're called shock, cryo, and burn. Uh, shock is uh, stun, basically. If you do enough shock damage, it will stun enemies. Cryo is freezing. If you do enough damage, it will freeze enemies and slow them. And then fire is damage over time, which is pretty consistent with fire in every single video game. All in all, the chance of finding weapon affixes is pretty low, but you can upgrade those chances with the roguelike elements, you know, upgrading your base camp, but we will talk about that later. Let's move on into the characters and classes. So you've got all these weapons, that's cool, but what about uh, your character? What about your class? So this game does have classes. There are six different robot classes in this game. You start off with only one, and then you unlock the other five, either by just leveling up, or completing different challenges, or even finding secrets. It's a very fun way to go about progression here. So let's just go into each one. Each class has a primary ability, a secondary ability, and a passive ability that 
alters your general stats or has fun uh, interconnectedness with your primary and secondary ability. So the base most generic class and really the most tanky option in general is the Guardian. Your primary is called Bastion. It's just an invincibility shield for a few seconds. Your secondary is called Bash. It's a pretty basic melee. And your passive is called Veteran, which increases your weapon impact and your mag slash energy mag size. Then you got your Ranger. This is typically the second class people get, at least it's the second one I got. It's also probably my favorite so far. It's a really stealthy one because of the primary called Stealth, where you deploy a decoy and then go invisible for a few seconds. And the decoy will draw the attention of enemies and they'll target that. Your secondary is called Javelin. Javelin throws a damaging Javelin. It's pretty straightforward. You get a couple charges. You can go pick them up manually from the ground, or you can wait for them to recharge over time. Your passive here is called Awareness, where you generate one focus point every second with a max of 16. When you have a focus point, that increases your critical damage by about 2% per point, and taking damage wipes all your points out. All right, moving into class number three, at least it was for me, Commando. This is the explosive focused class. The primary is a rocket. You launch a rocket, pretty straightforward. It does have a little bit of a homing nature to it. Secondary is called Shorty. It's a shotgun blast. And then your passive is called Frenzy. You generate stacks of Fury by getting eliminations, getting takedowns is what they technically call them in this game. And in general, damage against bosses. Having Fury increases your fire rate, reload speed, and your rocket and shorty attack speed. And I do need to make a correction here. It's getting takedowns on bosses and damage against bosses. Moving on, Engineer. This is the one for your companion lovers because of the primary called Deploy, where you spawn in a friendly robot drone that deals damage to enemies. It draws their attention. The initial limit is two, but you can level that up. And then there is a scrap mechanic here for this engineer, which is part of the passive. Basically, getting a takedown, getting an elimination generates one scrap, and that will reduce your cooldown for your drones. Your secondary, your blaster, which is firing an explosive, similar to the rocket for commando, also generates scrap when you hit enemies. It generates three scrap, which in turn reduces the cooldown for your drones. And then finally, your passive, uh, like I said, it has to do with scrap, but also it's called tinkerer. And basically, when you are at a max number of drones when you already have two deployed or more if you have a higher max. And pressing the deploy button again will heal them. And it also allows the ability to generate scrap uh, upon eliminating an enemy there. Either way, you don't have to pay too much attention to that. Just know that over time, you are going to be able to reduce your cooldown of your drones and just keep a little mini army behind you the whole time. This is super helpful on solo. I abuse it a lot in my solo runs when I'm not running with Ranger. Two left, and these two I have the least amount of experience with, but they are very, very strong. Recon is kind of the assassin class. The primary is called Blink. You dash forward, it's a nice dash, and then your passive is Dagger, which is a basic melee. Passive is called Overslash, and it requires combos. How do you get a combo? Well, you get a kill. You get an elimination. You get a takedown. That gives you one combo point. If you have five combo points, then your next Dagger attack is a 200% buff. It's 3x total damage. So, in general, over time, you can dash around, and you can slice people up and you can start getting some pretty insane assassin takedowns with your recon class. Finally, we have Elementalist. This is, uh, well, it's pretty straightforward based on the name, but it's also the hardest to unlock in my opinion because you have to do some secret stuff throughout multiple successive runs. You gotta unlock doors with codes and you can't all do it in one run. But it's very rewarding. Because so once you have it, the primary is called Trinity. Launches a strong elemental attack uh, based on whatever element you have active. And you're like, what are you talking about? Well, the passive is called Mantra. And the passive cycles your element every 10 seconds. Now, you can build into your class-specific perks, which we'll get into, uh, which will help you control that and focus on one of the elements. But in general, your element that is selected is cycling. And then based on which element is uh, alive, which is active, your primary will launch an attack of that element. So for burn, it's a fireball. For cryo, it's a series of ice shards. And for shock, it's a large chain lightning bolt. And then your secondary is comet, which is an elemental explosive orb, but it, it is indeed a random element. Then again, you can use your skills and, and make that the proper element that you want. Okay. <laughs> So that does it for the six main classes. You have some distinct play styles in there, but that doesn't mean you're locked down to any one style because again, there are lots of fun skills and abilities we're gonna get into as well as the loot and the weapons. The weapons are not specific to your class. You can find a lot of weapons and a lot of weapons work for a lot of different classes. So, hey, play with it. Anyway, let's stop mentioning it and let's just move into it fully. The loot and the upgrades. Each class has their own set of specific perks. When you level up, you get a choice in your screen, like a roguelike, of three different 
uh, abilities, basically. Three different class-specific perks to go into. They are perks, not abilities. Are they perks, though? You know, I'm just going to call them class-specific perks. If that's not the right word, then I don't know what to tell you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you'll get those, and those will typically augment your primary, your secondary, and your passive ability, as well as some other things that are loosely related to those abilities. And you can upgrade them over time, and eventually you can really, really, really hone in on certain aspects of your class that make a lot of fun. For example, the ranger deploys the decoy, right? Eventually, you can select perks that are specific to the class to make the decoy also fire back or maybe launch a second decoy or you stay uh, invisible for longer or you don't break the decoy when you fire your weapon even if you're it's only been once you get the point right there are also no shops but instead of an item shop there are basically safe zones throughout levels and i'll talk more about when those appear later in the video, but you have friendly NPC bots that you can purchase items from with your in-game, in-run currency known as the uh, power cells. These items, just like weapons, have a rarity system. There's common greens, there's superior blues, there's fantastic golds, like legendary, and then there's corrupted purples. Corrupted are very similar to Crab Champion's greed perks where there's a big positive, even stronger than uh, golds at times. But then there's a negative, there's a debuff attached to it, so it's a balancing act whether it works with your build and, and the way you like to play. I'm seeing about 115 total loot items across the various Wikipedias, which isn't the most for a game like this, but also isn't nothing. Because again, you still have your class abilities, you still have your class specific perks, and you still have the weapons on their own, which have affixes, which also come into play. So when you add up all of the different items and stuff, it's still a lot. I think it is worth noting anecdotally, I don't play this game on the hardest difficulty. There are many modifiers and stuff like that. You get up into the guardian ranks, but even on discovery, which is like extra easy mode, you really do not find a lot of those golds and corruptives. So the weight of those rarities is felt. Not to compare to Crab Champions again, but that game, it's just not hard to find legendaries. It's not hard to find greeds. They're supposed to be the rarest and the best, and it's just guaranteed that you find some of them, and runs go infinite in that game if you want. In this game, at least at the time of recording, there's a finite layout. There's a final boss, you beat him, you're done. Again, more on that later. So, finally, with the loot and upgrades, let's talk about the Rogue Light part of the game. Uh, you have a base camp when you spawn into the game before you go into a run, and you can access the workshop. And these upgrades are like the permanent stat buffs. You can have more friendly robots show up in those safe zones. Higher chance at those gold items, for example. Enemies drop loot items from time to time. It's a pretty low chance, but that chance can be improved. Those items can have a higher chance at being good items that you would actually care about. There's a lot of different stuff like that, and there's a whole page of at least 20 things that you can upgrade over time with the more permanent currency called wrenches. It just makes playing the game and going back in for another run that much more rewarding because you have those things you can continually increase over time. And in general, as you increase these things, the game gets easier. It's a nice uh, reward feedback loop. In my opinion, I I've continued to fall more in love with the rogue lights than rogue likes because of this form of uh, you know, meta progression. And it's not just boring in this game. It's not like, oh, 5% damage buff, 5% movement buff, 5% fire rate. You know, it's actually impactful stuff into the game, and I think it's executed extremely well. So yeah, we've got our abilities with our classes, right? But what about just generic abilities? Your movement, how does that feel? Because a lot of people like movement in these games. I, I focus on Crab Champions the most, and I find that movement to be extremely satisfying. So in this game, you start off with a basic sprint, slide, double jump. Not bad, double jumps, hey, better than just a sprint and slide, right? But you eventually find gadgets. There's tons of secrets throughout, and these gadgets are pretty cool. Some of them are just stat boosts. Some of them are movement uh, increases uh, under certain circumstances. There's a pogo stick where if you hold a crouch, you're like charging up a big jump, and then you let go, and it's... It's like maybe a triple jump amount of power. Eventually you even find things like a jetpack, grapple hook, the ability to do a slam attack if you're already in the air. All of these movement options combine into just an insane flow state. It's like Doom, you know, the, the new ones, not the Super Bowl ones, the new ones in 2015 and 2019, Doom Eternal, whenever that came out. But like better, dare I say better? Once it clicks, this game is hard to put down. For all intents and purposes, this is the best movement in the entire roguelike genre, maybe even FPS games as a whole. I know. Hey, aggressive statement. You just have to watch some clips and try the game out. It's not expensive. Go. There, I'm pretty sure there's a free demo anyway. Just go try it out. I, if you're looking for a movement shooter, this is the one. All right, so I've been yapping about the 
weapons, the items, the classes, the loot. What do you actually do in the game? Well, let's move into that section here, starting off with the enemies. There are 92 enemies in this game. I could be wrong, plus or minus one or two. And they're divided into about three categories. You've got your common enemies, your Goliath or elite enemies, just bigger, stronger, they, they might have shields. And then you've got your boss enemies. This variety is pretty good. It forces you to use your brain when you're entering areas and not just shoot everything because different enemies have different attacks and these different attacks affect you differently. And just in general, the game is punishing. Even on easy mode, you don't have a lot of health and the enemies hit hard. You gotta use your movement, you gotta use your abilities. But yeah, there's a good variety of enemies and I'm happy with it, I'm very happy with it. The game doesn't need 92 enemies, but unlike a game like Rotato in the first deep dive where all the enemies kind of feel the same, here the enemies do feel different. There's are smaller little robots that tick at you, there's some that fire big line attacks, there are some that blind you, and then there's some that fire big area of effect, the different elites, the bosses, it's a good variety. In general though, not too much more to say about the enemies. Make sure you keep your eye out for certain enemies because certain enemies are a lot harder than others. So we've talked about the enemies and I've hinted at the level design and how an act works, so let's get into that point right here now. Runs consist of what are known as acts. There's act one, there's act two, there's act three. Acts are the overarching structure. Each act contains one or more levels, often at least two, and each level split up into different areas. Remember, I was talking about those safe zones. Those act as kind of midpoints within an area, within a level, right? At the end of each act, there are boss fights. And like I said earlier, 10 different bosses. So there's some good variety, and that does depend a little bit on the path you take for some bosses, and then others, there's a pool where it could be any of two or three options. While the game does have a finite length, Currently, lots of different options. You'll see on the map right here. Look at that. This isn't just a couple options on each act. This is impressive, truly impressive. And you see all the question marks? Those are all secret locations. They're not blatantly stated. You have to stumble upon those. You have to explore, you have to find them. You have to go collect an item in a previous run on one side of the map and then take a different path on the next one and give it to an NPC that's hiding in a quarter to unlock an open door. Hey, you want this weapon? Let's go! Oh. It's addicting. Figuring out which paths you have to take to unlock certain things. You might notice that someone is asking for a pair of swim trunks, and then you remember that you uh, there was a beach area and another path, so you go there finally. Door's locked, so you have to unlock it from some other way. You finally get the swim trunks, and then you finally bring it back to the other guy, and you unlock a new gadget, and it's super rewarding. The game does naturally get harder as you progress from Act 1 to Act 2 to Act 3. Obviously, it's a roguelike. But your build really doesn't start to come together until Act 2, and Act 3 is where you get those insane flow state clips going that you may have seen here on YouTube or even on social media. So it really is a nice ramp progression, but that's to be expected and, and they do it very well here. So yeah, I don't wanna spoil too much of the fun here. You're gonna have to go play the game and figure out what those question marks are on your own, but just know that it is worth exploring every inch of every single area to find all the different collectibles and then the secret items to unlock gadgets and new areas to get to that final boss. Now let's move into the extras and just the stuff that really adds to uh, a fulfilling experience when you play a game. And I'm talking about the soundtrack, the ambiance, the plot, the story, etc. So guys, I know I uh, am very fond of Noise Storm's music in Crab Champions. It's awesome. It's all Crab Ray version 2.0 through 25.0. It's all great. Here, we've got Noise Cream, another noise guy making banger music. And we can end the, we can end the section right here, right now. This game sounds soundtrack hard that's it mic drop that's it that that's the synopsis that's the section it's an addictive mix of like synth wave and rock synth rock we're making up a new thing but man it gets the blood pumping like uh, very few other games do from opening the game and the main menu to various cutscenes to entering new areas to the boss fights he nails it it's one of the most enticing soundtracks of all time for a game uh so yeah just load in experience it man and then moving into more general ambiance uh it's impossible not to note that this game if you haven't noticed is a comic book style it's cell shading it's like borderlands but even more so because you get the little onomatopoeia when you reload and when you're shooting you get actual like comic strip style cutscenes with uh, voice bubbles. It is very, very cool and unique. If you were to describe this game as synthwave, cyberpunk, borderlands, roguelike, you'd probably be pretty accurate. This is a fast-paced, first-person, looter shooter, action roguelike that's a mouthful. Let's move on to the plot and story. This is one of the few roguelikes where there actually is a plot. There is a story. The year is 2700, and I'm, I'm ripping this straight from Wikipedia, so... 
don't act like I, I'm, I'm not doing anything special here, but uh, humans live scattered through the desert, struggling to survive. It's post-apocalyptic, it's bleak, until a young scavenger girl named Max stumbles across something that may help. An old guardian robot, which is the first class you unlock, lying abandoned in the sand. She reactivates it knowing that with a guardian by her side, she may be able to give mankind a fighting chance. Together, the two begin to explore the mysterious canyons that surround them, searching for answers and a way to survive. There's just one problem. The canyons are crawling with bad robots, determined to stop them from advancing. But who's controlling them? And what are they guarding within? I know this is, uh, you know, it's that kind of writing, but anyway. There's an awesome museum kiosk at the base camp that gives you more details on all the different weapons, the enemies, the plot, etc., the map. So, if any of the things that I've went over so far aren't perfectly crystal clear, just launch the game. Go read how they, developers, how they describe it. It might help you out a little bit more. It's like a, it's like a Pokedex. You can go in and see who you fought and see your past runs and everything. It's great. So that pretty much does it for this roguelike deep dive. I certainly missed some nitty gritty details. Obviously, there's a lot that goes into these games and it's impossible to summarize it all in one video of this length. But hopefully this helped you out. Hopefully you have a better idea of RoboQuest and how it stacks up against some of the other games in the genre. I personally love this one. It is one of my favorite games of recent years. And it just hit 1.0 release in 2023. It was in early access for a couple years. Player base is pretty healthy considering the genre, and I highly recommend. There is a demo, like I said. I think it's only Act 1, maybe, but it still gives you a nice taste of the game. And then, hey, if you want to buy it, it's $30 at full MSRP, which is very cheap compared to AAA now trying to charge $70 to $100 per game, so please consider it. But yeah, it's a great game. Go check it out. If you like the video, like the video. It helps me out. YouTube algorithm, all that stuff. Subscribe for more roguelike content. This is my third roguelike deep dive. If you're watching these chronologically, I intend to move on to stuff like Hades, Risk of Rain 2, Gunfire Reborn, Finding of Isaac, etc. So keep an eye out for those, as well as the main focus of my channel, which is Crab Champions. Tons of content with that game. Following a similar path of RoboQuest, where it's been in early access now, uh, coming up on a year here in a month or so, and uh, you know, we'll eventually hit a 1.0 release. So lots of exciting stuff happening with that as well. And I, uh, I'll keep you updated on those with dev updates. Anyway, that's all I got. Have a good one. See ya.